So, Krista, can I welcome you to Brookings First United Methodist? Um, you have been officially appointed by the bishop and the cabinet. It's a conversation that has been going for some time mm -hmm. as you've visited with the leadership of this church, as you've had discussions with the bishop, but it's now been officially published. I thought it might be great if our congregation could hear a little from you. Um, maybe we could start here. Won't you tell us something about your roots? Where did you grow up? Where's your family history? Where, who are you really? <laughs> that sounds pretty deep. We'll start out with uh, where I was born. So I was born in Dayton, Ohio, into a Christian home. I'm not a native South Dakotan. And I had a big extended family growing up. I was one of the oldest grandkids. And so I spent a lot of time being spoiled by aunts and uncles and playing with cousins. Um, and, you know, there's a river out behind my grandparents' house. And I just loved to play there. And I felt close to God when I was in places like that, as well as in church. Um, some of my earliest memories of worship are from church when I was a kiddo, uh, just singing with my mom and my dad. and. Uh, being part of that. Um, and so I also was part of youth group and summer camps growing up. So faith was a big part of, of my journey just growing up. And so I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know. But because sports teams and those kind of loyalties are huge, uh, without antagonizing everybody, do you have a sports team I, that you has know, your heart? I got to I got to go with the Jacks. I just love the Jack Rabbits and there's a reason for that. Uh, I love Brookings, but I also uh, am going to be soon marrying one of your own. So Jim Ducker is uh, he's works at SDSU. And so I have to be a Jacks fan. So and I'm happy to be so. So I love Brookings. and I love being here. But mm -hmm. OK, so I mean, that pleased everybody I out there <laughs> and they think you're just awesome because yeah. you but there's another big love in your life as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm getting married in June and I also, you know, I've had another love of my life for almost 13 years now and that's my son, Lucas. And so uh, we've been kind of introducing him to Brookings and showing him around. He loves the used book and comic shop downtown. And so we're, we're kind of getting introduced to that right now. I'm, you know, a teacher's aide for seventh grade because I'm helping him through homeschool like I'm sure many folks here are too and you know i spend time doing things that i love to do cooking for them and uh, i like to walk outside when it's a beautiful day like today and uh, just find those things that are good for the soul while we we kind of all navigate this season together so there's a third love that has accompanied you through most of your life and that's your love of jesus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell us a little how did you make a decision to follow Jesus? How did Jesus come and find you and captivate your life? You know, I'm, I am so grateful that I was born into a Christian home with parents who loved Jesus. And I remember some of my earliest memories of scripture uh, were just sitting and listening to my dad read the stories from the Bible and my mom. And she introduced me to some of the great works of literature, even as a kiddo, the Chronicles of Narnia. And so I was just steeped in faith um, from a very young age. And I even remember when I was about four years old, I'll never forget this, I was sitting in Sunday school. And after Sunday school was over, I had this beautiful Sunday school teacher. She had long blonde hair. And I remember sitting with her uh, on the Sunday school table as she talked to me about what it means to give your heart to Jesus. And so at four years old, I distinctly remember praying for Jesus to come into my life. And that was the beginning of my faith journey. And then over the years, of course, that has developed, but it was that, that's why I have a, a real love for um, and a respect and admiration for those who teach our kids mm. about Jesus, because mm. those moments can come anytime. Uh, and kids are really smart and they, you know, they, they can pick up a lot and understand some of those beautiful, simple truths about faith early on. So um, as I grew, my faith just, just grew as well. I had to learn what it meant to really surrender my life to Jesus. So you're sitting here tonight as a Methodist pastor. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is more than just 
giving your life to Jesus. This mm -hmm. is more than just choosing to belong to a faith community. Mm -hmm. Help us into understanding how you land up as a Methodist pastor. Well, sure. Well, I didn't grow up Methodist. I will admit that. That was uh, something that came along later in life. And there, was, uh, there, there were a lot of journeys and struggles up to that point. And I will have to say that I had to be convinced <laughs> uh, that God was calling me to be a pastor. And while there was so much that was good about my faith upbringing, I didn't see women in pastoral leadership roles growing up. So I just didn't have a frame of reference for that. And so it took a lot of time and a lot of encouragement from a lot of people to help me begin to see that those gifts that I had were actually given to me by, by God so that I could serve in pastoral leadership. And so really, that was a big leap for me. And I needed to realize that God had placed that call on my life. So I'm thankful to those mentors who came along and helped me to see that. But really, you know, God had to work on me for a while. But once you know, I had found my home in the United Methodist Church and began the journey into discovering my call, um, over the years, I've had the opportunity to serve in different leadership capacities in various churches. In uh, Northeast Ohio, I served as worship director and worship leader. Uh, I've taught uh, university and seminary courses in biblical studies. I've served as lead pastor in Sioux Falls and now up in uh, White and Sterling. And so I've had opportunities um, to gracious opportunities that have been offered to me to serve in a lot of different ways. And I think I'm at a point uh, now where I'm just excited to see. I, you know, I finally got the hint, like God finally got through to me that yes, this is where I'm called to be and I'm completely at home and excited to see the next steps in the journey. So, so I'm gonna catch you by surprise. It just strikes <laughs> me um, because we did talk about some of the things you'd say. Mm -hmm. Not everything's been easy. Mm -hmm. Some stuff has been a struggle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I'm hearing a testimony that says God carries you through both tough times mm -hmm. and good times. Oh yes, and God pursues. God pursues, because there have been, I think we all have times in life when we, we just kind of want to stop. <laughs> and we yeah. kind of say, okay, God, enough. I don't, want, I don't want your attention anymore. Just leave me alone. Let me have a, you know, a, a, a normal life. And in my case, God said, no, I'm not finished with you. Okay. you know? And so um, it, it has been a gracious chasing after my spirit. And I, I really believe God pursues us. And I'm grateful that God pursued me and brought me back and gave me an opportunity to serve even through and after and in between uh, some of the really tough times. And so here's the, for me, the clincher. This is not some career move. It's not like you're climbing some kind of corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why Brookings? What stuff do you bring here? What, what would be the passions and the 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 joys the things you could perhaps see yourself offering in this community i love that it's a university town i just i love brookings i love the size it's a small town it's but it's it's vibrant uh, and it just has a neat spirit it's a great place for families and the people are so friendly so just brookings it's brookings, brookings itself as a town i remember a couple of years ago when i was first getting settled into my appointment at white and sterling spending some time in brookings and thinking yeah, I could, you know, I could be happy here. I really like this town. So there's something about Brookings. It's not actually, this town's not actually that great. <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you, I arrived here and within weeks of arriving here, they told me go home and stay at home. Oh. So um, I'm hoping I you... know. How rude, right? <laughs> I mean, gee. <laughs> so yeah, I, I like, I really love this community and I'm really excited to get to know it better and actually after my my wedding in June to be able to live here and make my home here with uh, with Lucas and Jim is just really exciting to me I think in terms of um, areas of interest talents things that I've uh, um, by God's grace been able to develop over the years uh, there's some things that I love to do I love uh, leading worship I love being part of worship uh, I love preaching and teaching um, and, you know, in some of the experiences that I've had as uh, a prof uh, professor, adjunct professor over the years, 
I've come to really love the process of mentoring students through their journeys as well. So to be able to serve at a place that's so connected or close to uh, SDSU, uh, to be able to see what sort of creative connections might be able to be made there, uh, to be able to help support students in their journey through their academic life and into whatever's next for them uh, is really exciting to me as well. So help me out. Help us all out. And you know this question is coming because I'd asked you to think about it. <laughs> but what do you think the Spirit of God might be saying to us at this time? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think all of us are looking for courage. All of us need constant encouragement. Mm -hmm. But offer mm -hmm. us a bit of courage tonight. Well, absolutely. I, and the first thing I would say is I'm right there with you. <laughs> we are all in this together. And every morning we wake up and we face another day of this not quite knowing what's happening. And so, uh, you know, I've been through those kinds of seasons before in different ways. And there's a quote for me that I've found strength in over the years. And it comes to me from Eleanor Roosevelt. And she said, she's quoted to have said, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. And I think a lot of us wake up every morning <laughs> and we think, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Uh, and so we can sometimes feel a bit overwhelmed or a lot overwhelmed and exhausted. And I, I began to think a little bit about some of the experiences I've had over the years. A couple years ago, I had the privilege of working with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And I was kind of one of those people that would pick up the phone and talk to people who were struggling and feeling overwhelmed. And what that experience taught me was a couple of things. One is we all feel overwhelmed from time to time. Now, a lot of us are feeling overwhelmed at the same time right mm. now, which is a new mm. and unique experience for us, but that's human. We all feel overwhelmed sometimes. And the other thing that I learned through my time with talking with those people and being part of that service was when we feel overwhelmed, it's good to have a plan. It's good to have a plan of attack and some things we know that we can rely on that we can do to help us get through those moments when we feel overwhelmed. And so it made me think of that scripture that you read a little bit ago from 1 Corinthians 10. And especially in the beginning, those first few verses, when Paul is talking to these, these people from Corinth, this flock of his, he said he's focusing on what, what's bringing them together. He's focusing on what they have to unify them. He's bringing out the commonality of the people of God before Christ and the people of God after Christ, recognizing that we are all one big human family and we're all in the same boat. And so when he says that, um, uh, that we struggle, that we go through hard things, he doesn't say that to trivialize our struggles as much as to normalize our struggles. Um, just I just want you to say that to us again, because <laughs> some people have the yeah. impression that we follow God so that we won't have any struggles. Right. Yeah. And that's not what this says. It says mm. when you are tested, when you're tested, God will be there to mm. help you. And so when Paul begins that chapter by saying, hey, we're all in the same boat here, what he's saying is struggle is normal. Um, it's not small. It's not unimportant. It's still big and hard and, and uh, difficult, but it's normal. Mm. And so what Paul says to us is the struggle is human, but God can redeem the struggle. So when we feel that we're tested, when we're tempted, God provides us a way out. God gives us tools that we can use to, to cope and to get help. So, and so there were some things that I have been thinking about that have helped me lately. And so I wanted to share a couple of those things. I think that for me, a plan for getting through those moments of feeling overwhelmed is creativity, connection, movement, and stillness. And so what that means is at different times, we might need to, to, to create something. We might need to get in the kitchen and cook or go out to the shop and build something. We might need to connect with someone, make a phone call or do a FaceTime chat or check in on some of our folks who might be a little more elderly or vulnerable, help them out. We might need to just get outside and take a walk or sit still and pray and reflect. But these are things that we can do when we're feeling overwhelmed that help us to get through those moments, to help us to cope. 
And so we can, uh, we can do those things that sort of bring us back to the reality of who we are in Christ um, so that when we're feeling scared, we recognize that's, you know, that's a, an understandable feeling to have, but we belong to God and he gives us ways to cope with those things. So I would just encourage us, uh, if we're feeling overwhelmed, if we're feeling tested beyond what we can bear, to put a plan together and write it down. Uh, try Find ways to cultivate that creativity, connection with God and other people. Um, get out and move or sit and be quiet <laughs> and just practice those things. So I hope that's helpful. I, I know certainly I have had moments of feeling overwhelmed. Uh, and, and those things kind of help me to come back to my center a little bit in Christ. So, for example, food. What food do you cook? <laughs> you know, I'm not great, <laughs> but I like the process. So I like to, you know, carbs are always good. I mean, who doesn't like carbs? So banana bread, zucchini bread, cookies, you know, those kinds of things. Especially when my son's around, I like to make stuff for him. And um, so, so, yeah, I don't know if I can do it every week, but... I do like to, to bake some stuff every now and then. <laughs> and I do know you got out recently. You went where? Yeah, so one of my favorite places, uh, and right now I live in Sioux Falls, so I know a few more places around that area, but it's a place called Palisades State Park. And, you know, we, we observed social distancing. We were careful. You know, there were some people out, and we just kind of waved and said hello and stayed six feet away. Uh, but I love the terrain there, how beautiful it is, the rocky cliffs. My son loved to just amble up along the rocks and just get some time outside and uh, be in this beautiful creation that is coming alive. Nothing is stopping that from happening. The buds are on the trees. We're going to have spring. Life is going to go on. And that's just a good reminder from nature. It was, it was a good time. 